Good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke, and we're going to look at chapter 24 and read about the resurrection as we gather together today to celebrate Resur- Resurrection Sunday. Turn with me, Luke 24. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. And when they came back from the tomb, they told these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and others with them who told this to the apostles. When I was a kid, Easter was a holiday that I looked forward to. There was always an excitement in the air uh, on this Sunday. I looked forward to getting through the, the sunrise service. Our church always did a bright and early service. The Easter breakfast that would follow. Getting through the regular service as my father was a senior pastor. And then heading home as quickly as possible. Because I knew that when I got home, that somewhere in that house there was a basket hidden with some candy. Maybe some uh, marshmallow peeps. Uh, some different things. Maybe even a small little gift. I would cruise around the house looking and always hoping to find my basket before my sister found hers so that if I found hers along the way I could hide it and make it just a little more difficult for her to find hers. When we would find them there was a a joy and excitement of what kind of candy we had in a race to see who could put their peeps in the freezer first, hoping that they would freeze quickly and that we could eat them, because they're always better frozen. Now, you would think I was talking about myself at age five or six, but to be honest with you, I was probably still 18 or 19 years old when that was still happening. And I'm pretty sure my, my sister who lives in New York is... Uh, in Chicago with my mom to get away from coronavirus, and I'm pretty sure that uh, my mother this morning will hide something for my sister to find because that was what my mom always did, and my sister's 40-plus years old. She probably doesn't enjoy me saying that on the service. But that was normal, and that was what we knew, and that is what we expected that time of year. We understood what we were gathering to celebrate that Sunday each year. But what I looked forward to was not what I should have truly been celebrating. And I think that I've said this uh, every week for the past three weeks. But this is just kind of an odd, strange time, right? We're in right now. None of it feels right. This is the the new normal right now. And we all, I think, look forward to the day when this is over. And it seems like something's missing this year. And I myself probably need to get over that. But it is a time to remember and a time to proclaim the power of the resurrection. To look past the bunnies, the Easter candy, the hoopla that the world tells us we should be excited about, right? The the marshmallow peeps that come out this time of year. But rather focus on the greatest event that ever happened in the history of mankind. After all, this is why we gather on Sundays, right? Jesus wasn't resurrected on a Monday or a Tuesday. It was a Sunday, and that's why we worship each week on Sunday. So today we're going to look at the power of the resurrection in our lives and what does that mean. And I want to start out by saying and posing this, what if 
it, it doesn't mean anything at all? What if it lacks the value uh, in any way, shape, or form that we put on it? How would that change our situation? I'm sure that this is a topic that we could just do one whole sermon on and we could spend all day looking at this possibility, but we're going to fly over it and just give it a little look-see as we cruise along. So what if? We looked at the scripture, we see that the if we do the, the 30,000 foot flyover, you can pick a Matthew 27 and 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, but all tell us of the resurrection of Jesus. All give us a little glimpse of the story. So we know that Jesus was beaten, he was abused, he was hung on a cross, the most painful, terrible death of all time. And those people who were executed in that way were usually thrown into a pit or left to rot on the cross, but Jesus was brought down and buried in a tomb. The leaders of the church tell the, or the religious leaders at the time tell the leader of the Romans that they need guards placed there because the disciples have said they're going to steal the body because Jesus said he would rise again. Guards are placed there. The next day where we picked up in our passage, Luke, the ladies appear, the stone is rolled away, and there is no body. The body is gone. So the religious leaders tell the guards, the guards go to the leaders, tell them that something happened. The, guard, the leaders tell the guards to lie, and they'll cover up the story. So let's start there. So say we assume that 12 men, right, fishermen, tax collectors, nobody of real importance or skills and trainings, they were, say they were able to overcome one or numerous soldiers guarding the tomb. Seems like a tough feat, but say they did it. Say they were able to push the giant stone away that Scripture tells us numerous men took to close. They take the body, they run with it, and then we assume that they continue with the story that they've been saying for the last three and a half years. Right? They continue telling the lie that Jesus was the Messiah, that he rose from the grave, and that he is coming back. We know that scripture tells us that Jesus appeared to 500 plus people. So let's take them away and we just look at the 12. Those 12, for the next 40 years of their life, they never break from that lie. They never break from the lie that Jesus rose from the dead. They never gain any sort of fortune, fame, well-being from it. Peter Kreft says this, Why would the apostles lie? Liars always lie for a selfish reason. If they lied, what was their motive? What did they get from it? What they got out of it was misunderstanding, rejection, persecution, torture, and martyrdom. Hardly a list of perks. If you look at it, it's kind of an interesting concept. What happened to the apostles? We know that James was stabbed with a sword. The other James was stoned to death. Judas was, or Jude, sorry, was filled with arrows, Philip crucified, Thomas thrust with a spear, Paul beheaded in Rome, Peter crucified upside down at his request, John was the only one who died a uh, somewhat natural death, and he was imprisoned on an island, right? We can go on and on, stabbed with a sword, crucified, filleted and beheaded, crucified, crucified. What value would lying for 40 years have gotten them, other than death? Charles Colson sums it up best, I think, with this quote. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would, have, would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? 
Absolutely impossible. So see, we can see that there is plenty of evidence that proves that this isn't a fallacy, that this isn't made up. So what value is there for human beings if the evidence is there for the resurrection of Lord Jesus? First, we're going to look at Scripture. The power of the resurrection proves that Scripture is accurate and truth. We can go all the way back to the beginning of Scripture and look at numerous prophecies that foretold that the Messiah would come, die, and rise again. It starts all the way back in the beginning in the garden in Genesis 3, verses 15, and it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Jesus, or God already foretold of that Savior that would be coming. If you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Isaiah 53, verses 8 and 10, it says this, By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And the Lord, though the Lord makes his life a guilty offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the Lord will prosper in his hand. We see again that foretelling of the Messiah that would come, who would be bruised, he would be beaten, and he would one day rise again. One of the more interesting passages that uh, I actually didn't know about until I started studying for today's sermon was back in Job. And when you put these two passages together, it creates a great picture of the patriarchal and the question he asked in Job 14. He says, if a man die, shall he, not, shall he live again? Questioning, wondering, if I die because of my sins, because of the issues in my life, because of what's going on in the world, will I live again? But then a little later in Job 19, he says this, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and I in my flesh I shall see God. So even Job understood that there would be a bodily resurrection, and that that Savior would come and stand once again. Hosea 6, 2 says, After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will rise us up. He will raise us up. So we can see that those are just some of the Old Testament passages that predict and foretell of the Savior. Not only being killed and beaten, but raising to life. There's also some interesting New Testament passages that Jesus used to foretell or to tell what was going to be coming. And he draws on the Old Testament to do that to prove the power of his resurrection. Matthew 12, 40, he says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus was telling his disciples that Jonah and the whale, that, that story that foretold what was going to happen, the same thing. Look, just as Jonah was in the whale for three days, so the Son of Man will be buried, and on the third day he will rise again. In Luke 24, a little earlier in the passage than we read, he said, How foolish are you, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things, and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus takes his disciples aside and says, Look, these scriptures that you know and have studied have been pointing back to me all this time. The confidence that the scripture that we read week in and week out, the passages that we use to lead our lives and show us truth in a world full of questions. We have security that the resurrection affirms all of that. The resurrection shows us the truth of Scripture. But it also gives us freedom. Freedom from the grip of death. Freedom from the worry and strife of what is to come when it all comes to an end. 
This is one of the things that I've always thought interesting when you look at the scheme of life of non-believers versus believers, and that is, what value do you find in life if there's nothing after the end? We can try all we want to leave our name on many things and make ourselves as known as possible, but at some point, one day, it'll all be forgotten. My dad grew up in the small town of Norfolk, Nebraska. It's probably not known for much of anything other than one thing. It's the home where Johnny Carson was, was born, where he spent the early part of his life. And you can drive through that little town, I guess maybe it's a mid-sized town now, and you can find his name all over the place. Right? Johnny Carson has kind of left a, a legacy of who he is and what he was on his name, on streets, on buildings, on different things like that. But guess what? One day that will all come to an end. And at some point, the name Johnny Carson will have no value or meaning whatsoever. The famous preacher John Knox tells a story much of the same. He was visiting a church in Virginia where his father had pastored 50 years earlier. And Knox spoke of his father to the people there, and he said to some of the older members of the church, asking questions about his father, and they remembered him quite vividly. But there were few, and as time passed, they were becoming less and less, and someday that would finally be one, and maybe none that would remember his father. He said his father's name might be remembered because it had been memorialized in a church window, but it still meant little or nothing to the succeeding generations. And he says, here is the supreme pathos of human life. Not that we die only, but that any real and living memory must die too. Unless God has raised us from the dead, it is the end as though we had never lived. How sad and true, right? No matter how big of a name I make for myself, no matter what I do in this world, it'll all disappear someday. Yet the resurrection assures us that God who raised Jesus to life again will someday do the same for those who believe in Jesus. The hope of immortality burns in everyone who believes in Jesus. In the resurrection, this longing of the human heart merges with an infutable reason to believe in an afterlife. Right? Those of us who are believers, we have something to look forward to. The Bible says in John eleven twenty five, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Clarence Hall said this once, The resurrection of Jesus changes the face of death for all his people. Death is no longer a prison, but a passage into God's presence. Easter says you can put truth in a grave, but it won't stay there. Easter says you can wrap it up, you can nail it to a cross, wrap it in winding sheets, and shut it in a tomb, but it will rise. In John 14, 19, it says, Because I live, you also will live. So we know that there is nothing, there is something better for us to come. That we are just aliens in this place, and that one day the Lord will return, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess. And some of those people will spend an eternity in hell and torment because they didn't believe in Jesus. And for those that have the hope of the resurrection, there's a promise of an eternity with God in heaven someday. And as amazing as that sounds, that's not the best part of the resurrection, right? That someday we don't have to worry about fear of death. But the value and the most power of the resurrection comes in the message that it brought. The gospel message itself. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 
We're going to read verses 3 and 4 and then jump down to 12 and 14. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 says this, For what I received I passed on to you, as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised, on the third day according to the Scripture, and then appeared to many. If we jump down to 12, it says this, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. In Acts 13, we can read this. Verses 32, and then down to 38 through 40. We tell you the good news. What God promised our fathers, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. And then if you jump down to 38 through 40, it says this, Therefore, my brothers, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. Hmm. The resurrection of Christ from the dead proves that every believer in Christ is justified from all things that they've done. When we read Romans 4.25, it says that Jesus was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Jesus was crucified on the cross because of your sin, my sin, the sin of everyone who ever lived and ever was to come. He was raised because to triumph over that sin and to make us just before God. But you may ask, how does the resurrection prove that believers are forgiven of all sin and can be reckoned right before God? We know that Jesus went to the cross for those sins, the sins of the world, those to come and those in the past, to pay the price that we never could pay. Matthew 20, 28 says this, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for the many. That is good and all that he gave his life as a ransom. But if God didn't accept that ransom, it was for nothing. It would be like the lamb that was slain every year in those Jewish temples, it would cover for a time, time, but it'd have to be done again and again and again. John MacArthur says, The resurrection of Christ is the single greatest event in the history of the world. It is so foundational to Christianity that no one who denies it can be a true Christian. A person who believes in a Christ who was not raised believes in a powerless Christ, a dead Christ. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then no redemption was accomplished at the cross and your faith is worthless. If Christ was not raised, his death was in vain, your faith in him would be pointless, and your sins would still be counted against you with no hope of spiritual life. Yet, when God raises Christ triumphantly that Sunday morning, right? From the dead, he raises him up, and it's if he proclaims to the whole universe, I have accepted the sacrifice which Jesus made. The resurrection proclaims the full endorsement and acceptance of the Holy God on Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. The resurrection was a confirmation that God had accepted the sacrifice of Christ as meeting all the demands of his holiness. The resurrection proves that forgiveness of sins is possible for anyone. And it's certain for everyone who turns in repentance and faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an amazing power in the resurrection. That's the gospel that we all know so well. 
If you don't know the gospel that I talk about right now, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior today, and you want to know more about what that means, what the resurrection means to you, you can find our information online, firstbaptistchurchgrovecity.org. Um, our information will be on the YouTube page and website. One of our leaders or myself will contact you and have that conversation. I want to close with a quote from Tim Keller. And it kind of sums up everything we've talked about here today. It says this, If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he is. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. It's a lot to think about. But that's why we celebrate this day. Because he rose from the dead. He conquered sin, he conquered death, and he made a way for us to be made right with God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your resurrection. Thank you that your sacrifice on the cross, your death, your burial, that because you lived a perfect life, because you were the ultimate sacrifice, that you took that sin on you, Lord, that you could stand before the Father and that he could say we are all made right when we put our faith and trust in you. That we are truly justified through him. We thank you for that sacrifice that he made, but Lord, that when he rose from the grave, when he conquered that death and sin, Lord, that that proclaimed a powerful message. And we thank you for all this in your name. Amen.